Okay, anatomy students, this is the last section of lecture material, the last video lesson for the integumentary system, and today we're going to talk about uh, homeostasis and balance within the skin, primarily in wound healing and uh, burns and aging with the integumentary system. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, this is going to be our last um, video lesson. So let's go ahead. Um, skin damage sets in motion a sequence of events that repairs the skin to its normal or near to normal structure and function. So here we have a little bit of a flow chart. Um, so you have uh, stimulus disrupts homeostasis by increasing or decreasing a controlled condition that is monitored by and then you go to receptors. So this is when the damage occurs that sends the stimulus to the control center, which is your brain. And then the brain uh, receives the input and will then provide output, which is in the form of a nerve impulse or chemical signal to the effectors. Uh, that brings about a change. So a response that alters, which could be moving the body part away from wherever the stimulus occurs. If there is damage, then there's going to be a chemical response to begin the process of healing that wound. That is the flow chart of how your body deals with uh, damage and wound healing. So uh, talking about wounds, there are uh, two kinds of wound healing processes that can occur depending on the depth of the injury. So first, a superficial wound or an epidermal wound, the healing of the epidermal wound occurs following superficial wound that affect only the epidermis. So a very shallow or superficial cut or scrape that uh, does not penetrate through the epidermis into the dermis. A deep wound occurs when an injury extends to the dermis and into the subcutaneous layer. Uh, many times, this is a wound that will require suturing to close. Some loss of functions and development of scar tissue is the rule. So there will be an epidermal wound healing there typically is minimal, if any, scarring. And in deep wound healing is where you can see some scarring. And again, it will depend on the depth of that wound into the dermis. Um, going shallow into the uh, reticular region uh, will probably have a minor scar that will probably fade a lot of times it'll fade in time. You'll still see it, but it won't be as prevalent as it was over the years. And in a deep wound um, that is down into, well into the subcutaneous layer, um, that is going to be one that is uh, pretty pretty noticeable for, for the, the rest of your life. So here's a diagram showing how the wound will heal in an epidermal wound. So there is a cut or an abrasion that will separate the uh, cells of the epidermis. And as you can see, it just goes down. It doesn't penetrate the dermis. So the wound healing starts at the base and works its way up, which makes sense because uh, these are the cells that divide. So these cells, when there's space in between them, they will rapidly divide to close the gap, and then those cells will push their way out. And as you can see, that's what we have here. So these were the first cells to close the gap that was made in the epidermis, and these are dividing and working their way out. And eventually, uh, this will close, and you'll have uh, that gap will be healed. Deep wound healing uh, is going to be a little more involved. So if a cut will not only penetrate the epidermis down into the dermis, then that is going to result in bleeding. 
because you have uh, gotten down to the blood vessels. So that is typically going to be, uh, the bleeding is going to be plugged up with a blood clot. And so basically this entire thing is a blood clot right there. And um, it's your body's way of plugging up the hole to keep you from bleeding out. I'm sure in biology, you talked about the um, X-linked or sex-linked characteristic genetic condition known as hemophilia. A, a person with hemophilia lacks the ability for their blood to clot so that a simple cut like this uh, without medical treatment, without help, uh, could be life-threatening. They could slowly bleed out. Uh, but if you are not a hemophiliac, then your body has a way of plugging up the hole so that you don't lose as much blood. So all of this, all of from here, you see blood clot, blood clot. It, expand, it extends all the way down here to plug up the hole in the blood vessel. And as it dries, it forms the scab. And you can see there are lots of macrophages. These are cells that fight infection to keep infection out of the wound. Um, you have uh, a neutrophil that is another uh, component, a different kind of white blood cell that's coming in there to, to keep the infection down. And then as that, as the connective tissue then closes the gap here and heals, that is what results in a scar and gives a scar tissue. And uh, you can see the epidermis has closed back and you're left with the scab on the surface that, uh, you know, we always pick off because, you know, it's what people do. Burns. A burn is a tissue damage caused by excessive heat. It can also be caused by electricity, radioactivity, or corrosive chemicals that denature or break down the proteins in skin cells. So let's talk about denaturing a protein. What does that mean? Well, protein is a long chain of amino acids. I'm sure we all remember this from biology. Uh, when the, that, when a protein is heated, gets too hot, those bonds between those amino acids break and the protein falls apart. That is called denaturing. Um, you, without knowing it, I'm sure everyone listening to this uh, has seen when a protein denatures. If you have ever fried an egg, you've seen the, the denaturing of protein. When you crack that egg and put it on that hot skillet and the egg turns white, then that is the protein, that, that part of the egg is the albumin. And when the protein, when it turns white, you know, the white of the egg, that is the protein in that part of the egg that is denaturing. It's falling apart. It gets too hot. So that's what it means by denature of protein. Burns destroy some of the skin's important contributions to homeostasis, such as protection against microbial invasion. Your skin is a great wall or physical barrier of keeping infection out of your body. If the skin is, is burned and opened, then it obviously uh, will reduce its ability to fight that infection. And desiccation or drying out, uh, you will lose with your, the skin uh, in a third degree burn when the skin is destroyed. Uh, you don't have that waterproofing agent there to hold moisture into your body. And uh, you can lose a lot of water to the atmosphere. And then, of course, thermoregulation, which is help helps keep our body at a constant body temperature. Burns are graded according to their severity. So we did mention this a little bit in lesson one. I think it was lesson one. Um, so a lot of this will be repeated, but you know, most of you are teenagers and you can use a little repetition in your life when it comes to your education. So first degree burn involves only the epidermis. It is characterized by mild pain, uh, redness, also known as urethema, uh, no blisters, and skin functions remain intact. So basically, it, this is your, your stereotypical sunburn. The skin is red. Um, it hurts to touch. 
but you haven't really destroyed anything. You've just reddened the skin. This will cause your body to increase its melanin production and you will tan. Uh, you will probably lose the, those cells that were burned deeper in the epidermis when they make their way out to the top in a few days. Um, those are the ones that will flake off. You, know, you, you will start to quote unquote peel. Uh, and that is a first degree burn epidermis only but the function of the skin. So you don't, you still have its ability to fight infection and uh, keep your constant temperature and, and not lose moisture to the atmosphere, but it is painful to the touch. A second degree burn is also known as a, a partial thickness burn, the same as a first degree, because it does not go all the way through the skin. It burns down into the dermis and is typically associated with blistering. Now, some of you, um, especially the individuals that have red hair and very fair skin, have probably burned to the point of blistering, which means you had a second degree sunburn burn. Um, most of the time, uh, it is when you touch something hot. You know, looking at this picture, uh, this almost looks like uh, this kid grabbed a, a hot curling iron, uh, you know, something like that. <clears throat> so the second degree burn goes through the dermis, but does not penetrate the subcutaneous la layer, destroys the dermis and part of the story, excuse me, destroys the epidermis and part of the dermis. Some skin functions are lost because of the blistering redness, blister formation, edema and pain result. Not fun. I've had a few second degree burns and they do hurt. A third degree burn is a full thickness burn. This destroys not only the epidermis, but the dermis and the subcutaneous layer. Most skin functions are lost. The region is numb because sensory nerve endings have been destroyed. Uh, now, if we look at this picture, so I'll draw. You know, if you look here where it's charred, that getting that burn hurts. But afterwards, that part of the burn is numb. But if you look closely, and especially on the ring finger here, this has been charred. But here is a blister. So that means this part is numb. But the second degree burn around it is still going to be very painful. So, uh, and you also see some blistering around this burn as well. So a lot of times when someone obtains a third degree burn, there is second degree burning that is around the area where the third degree burn was obtained. And that part is going to hurt. And it does hurt to get the burn. But once the tissue is destroyed, then that section is numb to the touch. According to the American Burn Association's classification of burn injury, a major burn includes all of the following different combinations. Uh, if you have third degree burns over 10% of the body surface, that is to be considered a major burn. Or if you have second degree burns over 25% of the body surface, that is also considered to be a major burn or any third degree burn on the face, hands, feet, or perineum, which is the groin area that is considered to be uh, a major burn. So uh, there it does it, the anal and urogenital regions. That, that sounds pretty major to me. Of all the places to get burned, um, that doesn't sound like the one that I would pick. When the burn area exceeds 70% or more, you have about a 50% fatality rate. So burned over 70% of your body, usually uh, you've got a 50-50% chance of survival. A quick means for estimating the surface area affected by a burn in an adult is the rule of nines. So basically, just about all of the body parts are divided into areas of nine. 
9%. Um, so count 9% if both the anterior and posterior surface of the head and neck are affected. So half of that would be four and a half. So if just the front of your head and neck is burned, that would be a four and a half percent, a burn over four and a half percent of your body. But because it is your head and neck region, that would be considered a major burn. You count 9% for both the front and back or anterior and posterior surfaces of each upper limb, so your arms. If you go both um, anterior and both arms would be 18%. So, you know, because you have two arms and two times nine is 18. Count four times nine or 36% for both front and back surfaces of the trunk, including the buttocks. Insert your forest Gump impersonation there. And count 9% for the anterior and 9% for the posterior surfaces of each lower limb as far up as the buttocks. Total of 36% for both lower limbs, both legs. Your legs are much larger than your arms, so that's why they count for more. And here's a diagram showing the breakdown. So just the front of your arm is 4.5%. If you go front and back, that's 9%. Both arms would be 18%. Uh, front of the head and neck is 4.5%. Both front and back is 9%. Uh, if you go the trunk, front and back is 36%. The perineum or the urogenital area is 1%. And then the legs, front and back, are going to be 36%. And if you add all of them up, you come up with 100%. Development of the integumentary system. The epidermis develops from the ectoderm. Um, if you remember from biology, uh, your uh, development of the uh, zygote, which is a fertilized egg, um, it starts to divide through mitosis, and we all know we started off as one cell that divided to make two, and two made four, and those those divided to make eight, and those eight cells divided to make 16, and so on and so on. And then as you develop, you get your germ layers, your ectoderm, your mesoderm, and your endoderm. Well, the outer layer of that ball of cells, the three layers, would be the ectoderm, and that's where your skin comes from. Nails, hair, and skin glands are epidermal derivatives. The dermis develops from the mesoderm. So your skin, the, the total organ of your skin, both top and bottom layers, your epidermis and dermis, come from different germ layers when you were just a ball of cells. The epidermis comes from the ectoderm, and the dermis comes from the mesoderm. Aging and skin, the integumentary system changes with age. Wrinkles develop, usually due to breakdown of elastin, and the biggest destroyer of elastin is UV radiation. For those of you who enjoy spending time in the tanning bed, um, you are just going to cause yourself to wrinkle earlier in life, or if you spend a lot of time out in the sun, without the appropriate coverings and sunblock and so on, um, you are just going to wrinkle sooner. But, uh, you know, it's one of the facts of life. Uh, dehydration and cracking of the skin will occur as, as the uh, individual gets older. Sweat production increases. Um, you know, as you get older, you will sweat more. And I'm sure we all know uh, older people that seem to sweat a lot. Uh, an increase in the number of functional melanocytes results in gray hair and atypical skin pigmentation, uh, aka the liver spots. Um, my facial hair is getting more gray as I uh, get older and older. Eventually, someday it'll be totally gray, and I can't wait because I, I always say that I will look so distinguished with a totally gray beard. Uh, the subcutaneous fat is lost, and there's a general decrease in skin thickness. Um, elderly people, you'll notice that a lot of times there's, they get cuts and, and bruises easily. And the nails, both of the finger and toe variety, 
will become more brittle. Also, a lot of times, elderly people, especially if they spend a lot of time in bed uh, there because they have a decrease of circulation, a lot of times uh, they will get a condition called a decubitus ulcer, which is also known as a bed sore. This type of pressure ulcer are all too common in nursing homes because those people, uh, number one, have a, with age, they have a decrease in their uh, circulatory effectiveness and the skin because of the the long periods of laying in the same spot and the, the constant pressure that their skeleton will put on the skin due to gravity even uh, more drastically will cut circulation off to that part of the skin and the skin begins to die and that's what a bed sore is so here is someone who has been laying on their back for such a long period of time that the heel bone has pushed on the skin and the skin has lost blood supply and has started to die. And you get this wound uh, known as a bed sore or a decubitus ulcer. And these are again, commonly seen in nursing homes where those uh, people just can't get out of bed. So what they try to do, though, is get them up, get them moving. They try to rotate them, get them to roll over, you know, lay on their side, that kind of stuff to kind of help their circulation. But for some of them, it just can't be helped. And that is going to conclude all of the lecture material for the integumentary system. All right, that's it. That's all of the lessons for... Uh, the video lessons for the integumentary system. So uh, if you're on home quarantine then or not in class, then hopefully this was beneficial in uh, keeping you up to date with what we're doing in class. So as always, thanks for watching and we'll talk to you later.